Professor Stan Rosen of Boston University, who was Plato? Plato was the student of Socrates. Uh, more precisely, he's usually regarded as the founder of the history of philosophy in its more formal sense. In other words, there were a number of figures called wise men or even uh, uh, philosophers who lived before Plato, but he's the first person to have uh, created a substantial body of work, of philosophical work, and is uh, regarded as the kind of fountainhead of the Western philosophical tradition. When did he live? Well, he lived uh, in the 5th and 4th centuries B.C. He was born in uh, 428 and died in something like 348. So he, in other words, uh, encompassed uh, the, uh, the Peloponnesian War and the uh, loss of the Athenian Empire, the glory and the decay of classical Greece, you could say. Plato's life spanned that period. I should go back and ask you, based on your first answer, who was Socrates? Socrates was Plato's teacher. Socrates was uh, a, a very uh, extraordinary man who never wrote anything. Uh, he was famous for uh, uh, asking people embarrassing questions, such as, what is truth? Or, what is the good life? Or, why did you do what you did when you took your father to court for impiety? Or something of that sort. Socrates, uh, in other words, trained uh, a group of people of whom the most famous was Plato. He did that largely, or almost entirely, as far as we know, orally, simply by conversation with them. Hence the uh, famous Socratic method of asking questions and uh, uh, carrying on philosophy in a dialogue form, rather than delivering formal lectures. What would they have been like back in Athens uh, in, in, what, 2,500 years ago? What would have, how important would they have been in that community? People like Socrates and Plato? Yes. Well, uh, you know, that's an extremely interesting question. Socrates, we, we revere Socrates today as a great philosopher and, a, as Plato said, the justest man of his day. Socrates' reputation was not that good in Athens. He was associated uh, with troublemakers because he went around asking embarrassing questions like, what is the nature of uh, the divine? Uh, do the gods actually do and say the things that our great uh, poet theologians like Homer and Hesiod have said that they say? In other words, Socrates was perceived by the average Athenian as a kind of eccentric who represented a danger to the stability of the state. And many of the uh, people with whom Socrates spoke were sons, young sons, of the wealthiest and politically most prominent families. And by engaging these young kids in conversation about such fundamental questions as what is justice, Socrates was implicitly committing treason because obviously the official answer to the question, what is justice, is whatever the Athenian laws say it is. So Socrates was considered a, a rather difficult person, and finally, through a series of circumstances that it would take too long to summarize at the moment, was put to death by the city. Plato was in a slightly different position. He was very rich, belonged to a, a very prominent family, had a great political career ahead of him, which he uh, entered into briefly at, at, at quite a young age, and then dropped out of and devoted the rest of his life uh, to philosophical research. He also founded the first, uh, as we would call it today, university, Plato's Academy. So he, he was a man who, uh, who had the opportunity to go into politics and who uh, tried it and turned it down and devoted himself to teaching and writing his famous dialogues and training his students who carried on the tradition uh, at Plato's Academy or as, as we would say university. In a few minutes we're going to show a discussion uh, of about 12 people sitting around a table yeah. at uh, Politics and Prose Bookstore here in Northwest Washington and it's called the Classics Book Group and they do this uh, every first Tuesday of each month mm -hmm. and uh, it's it, we've had it on tape since uh, June and July uh, it's interesting to watch just the average person I don't know that they want to be called the average person sitting around talking about Plato and Socrates and all of this that you're talking about. How long have you taught this subject? Approximately 43 years. 43 years. Now, how, are the kids in the, over the years in your classes uh, there because they choose to be, or is it, an elect, is it a uh, requirement at either Penn State, where you were for 38 years, or at Boston University, where you've been for five? Well, of course, my classes are of two kinds, undergraduate and graduate. The graduate courses are those in which I train people who wish to become professors of philosophy or professional philosophers in some way. The attendance there is all voluntary. The undergraduate courses are mixed. Uh, 
I, uh, one course I teach is uh, an undergraduate introductory course with 185 students. And uh, it's hard to give you a general statement, uh, but most of them are there because they want to be. In other words, it's true that they'll have to take an elective course in humanities, but it could have been in something else. So philosophy courses tend to be self-selecting, in other words. Uh, you tend to see a better, better group of students. Well, you know that this is not the easiest subject to, uh, to talk about, especially if you're just kind of on the periphery. And I guess what I'm leading up to is, when do you see students really kind of kick in and start to uh, enjoy this subject, and, and how do they get there? What do you do to, to right. interest them? Right. That's a very important question. Obviously, I've devoted my life to thinking about it. I think the most important thing that, that I would uh, uh, say is it is necessary to show students that philosophical questions emerge directly from their everyday life. In other words, if one presents a kind of technical uh, series of lectures using very fancy terminology and talking about extremely abstract topics like the one and the many, the nature of being, the relationship between being and non-being, and so on and so forth. Or even if one begins by saying that, well, philosophy is about the structure of knowledge, and in particular scientific knowledge, and we have to learn how to deal with concepts and logical systems. That's fine for graduate students, but it doesn't work with the uh, undergraduate who's there to fulfill a humanities requirement. On the other hand, if you can show these kids that the things that they are deeply concerned about, like what, the, what should they do with their lives? What is a correct moral code? How do they stand with respect to their religion? Uh, that kind of thing. If you can do that in language that they speak, not in professional jargon, then it's really quite uh, astounding how uh, the, the fires of philosophy begin to burn in their souls. But it's got to be done in that kind of semi-colloquial way. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Why do you think Socrates and Plato have survived all these years? Well, one part of the uh, answer is this. Plato was perhaps, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to state this in an unqualified way, but I think most, many, or perhaps even most of my colleagues would agree with me. Plato was the greatest artist and writer, in the sense of uh, master of prose, of all the philosophical, of all the members of the Western philosophical tradition. Most philosophers can't write very well, I mean, by literary standards. You know, it's no fun reading Hegel or Leibniz or Immanuel Kant among the moderns. Aristotle uh, depends what you're reading, but it, m m many of his writings are extremely technical. Plato, of course, wrote some very technical dialogues, but on the whole, reading Plato is comparable to reading Shakespeare or uh, Dante or, let us say, uh, one of the great Greek tragedians. Now, I don't mean to imply that there are no substantive differences between the Platonic dialogues and these works of art, but the central answer to your question is that Plato was a great, great poet, a great artist. Okay, this is uh, not related so much to poetry as it is to everyday use of language here now in the 20th century, or soon to be the 21st century. When someone says they have a platonic relationship with another person, right? where does that phrase come from? Uh, it comes, of course, from uh, uh, Plato's interpretation of the human soul as erotic, as marked by eros, which means literally sexual love or, or passion. But the platonic presentation of the doctrine of Eros in the dialogue, the Symposium, uh, represents the differences in types of human beings as uh, in terms of the degree to which their erotic appetite moves upward from the body through to beautiful works of art to uh, productions of uh, science and uh, finally culminates in pure, in the, in the vision of the pure so-called platonic ideas what we could call the eternal forms that constitute the structure of intelligibility of the world. A platonic relationship, then, is one in which the physical eros, the sexual eros, has been transformed. As Freud would have said, who was not uninfluenced by all of this, sublimated. In other words, the sexual eros must be sublimated to love of the soul, and the love of the soul must in turn be sublimated into love of the objects of the soul, namely the eternal beings or forms that he called ideas. So if someone has a platonic relationship, we think it means non-sexual? That's that correct. That's correct. There can be, a, a, and, a, and certainly would be, a component of sexual uh, desire in this. From Plato's standpoint, all human relationships uh, contain an erotic element. I, I don't want to, again, uh, oversimplify, but there, there are certain similarities between Freud and Plato. The great difference uh, is this. 
Freud explains the highest human appetites or human desires in terms of the lowest. In other words, he starts from, uh, starts from the bottom, or, or, or differently stated, says, well, the reason why we have friends or the reason why we go into a certain occupation or uh, the reason why we have uh, certain political or moral views can be explained in terms of lower desires which have been hidden from us by rationalizations. Plato does it in the reverse order. He says if you want to understand, if you want to understand sexual love or friendship, you have to understand it as a corporeal, a bodily manifestation of the eros of the human spirit, which when purified of the physical love, rises to uh, the non-physical, uh, what we would call spiritual or intellectual. So that, that's, the, uh, uh, that's correct. In other words, a platonic relationship would not be a, a fundamentally sexual one. But let's not forget that there is a sexual component in all human relations from Plato's standpoint. Professor Rosen was born in Warren, Ohio, and he is in Boston, as we are talking here on this program, for 43 years, has been a professor of philosophy and poetry. And um, we're going to talk more with him um, after this discussion is over. But before we do there, just a couple quick questions. What was the difference in age between Socrates and Plato? Uh, uh, one generation, approximately. About, about uh, 28 years. When they killed Socrates, how old was he? 71. And how long did Plato live? Plato lived uh, uh, approximately 80 years. And when Plato was a student of Socrates, uh, at what time in their lives was this? In other uh, words, was Plato just know. a kid? Or? No, 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 no. He was, I would say he was approximately, uh, you know, it's hard to see. These things are not known with precision, incidentally. But he was probably in his 20s. He was probably in his 20s. Now, he saw Socrates put to death, of course. And where was he put to death? Uh, in the city of Athens. Right down there below the Acropolis? Was That's it right, yeah. He took the hemlock in the prison cell. They accused him, the Athenians accused Socrates of uh, corrupting the young and of not believing in the gods in which the city of Athens believed and in bringing in new gods. And how important was Athens uh, in, in those days? Athens was, uh, one could say, the peak of, uh, <laughs> I was going to say Western civilization, but it was the, it was at, it was, it was the most uh, magnificent uh, of the political uh, entities of the 5th and 4th centuries BC. It wasn't the largest. The Persian Empire was, of course, much bigger. But uh, Athens was the most important of the Greek cities and was the center of philosophy, science, art, the techni, the, uh, the arts and crafts, and was also a great political power. We're talking about the period, in other words, uh, just before uh, uh, Socrates, the period dominated by uh, Pericles, the great statesman. And Athens was at war with, uh, with Sparta, but the war was actually a much larger phenomenon. It was a, an attempt by the Athenians to maintain dominance over the uh, Mediterranean world, at least uh, up until the point where the uh, Persian Empire took over. So Athens was extremely important. I was, I'm tempted to say that uh, from an intellectual standpoint, Athens was a kind of synthesis of Manhattan and Washington. In other words, it was the center of, of artistic and, and intellectual and literary life, but also the center of political intriguing and power and the desire for the uh, uh, intensification of uh, uh, the, ex the extension of the, Ameri of the Athenian uh, Republic. I, I, I started to stammer when I said that because I don't, want to, I don't want to condemn American foreign policy as being simply imperialistic. But I was thinking of the extraordinary political uh, interests in Washington, uh, which often don't extend beyond the Beltway, you know, to most Americans. And uh, similarly, the, uh, the extraordinary uh, intellectual and artistic activity in, uh, uh, in uh, New York. So you could think of Athens as a kind of combination of, of Manhattan and Washington. In, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to go to the Politics and Prose Bookstore. And, and show you, this is actually uh, an interesting experiment on our part at C-SPAN. Richard Hall is a one-man band producer and photographer for this program. You'll, he, he edited it. He did it a whole. He conceived it. He, um, he brought us Professor Rosen. Um, and, and you'll notice in this program all throughout it, this discussion that the, you can see from time to time Richard off to the right. And it's just a small little detail at 2,500 years after Plato and Socrates that uh, we're able to do this kind of communication with one human being.